I'm Tuck. I use they them pronouns. And I've been a sex educator. Well, I started doing sex education work when I was in college. And it was like very like peer education. I went to Reed College in Portland, Oregon. And I had the experience there of being like, wow, like a lot of the resources for students are very like pregnancy focused and STI focused. <clears throat> Excuse me. And and I I was like really more interested I was like I feel like I have a grasp on that like I don't really like I was like yes like we need that um but I was like I really need help having like good sex because I was like in college trying to explore like having just a lot of weird experiences like not all bad but just like weird didn't feel that you know it wasn't the sex that I wanted to be having so I started this like just on group uh, on campus group that was like hosted it was hosted in my camp on campus apartment once a week and I would like put like you know um, pillows and blankets on the ground and have snacks and we'd like all meet and just talk about different pleasure and sex related topics and it was sort of like a brainstorm style where I would kind of like facilitate the conversation but we'd all sort of be like okay what do we know like what is the information we have that we've gotten up to this point? And then we would like research and sometimes other people would do like little mini um, lessons and stuff. So that was how I started. But that experience was actually like pretty emotionally draining for me um, because I sort of got this reputation on campus for being somebody who was like, you know, like really like sexually knowledgeable I guess or like mm -hmm. or a little sex obsessed maybe mm -hmm. and so people would like come up to me when I was just living my life and and would like share really intense traumas that had happened to them mm -hmm. or like ask questions that I didn't feel qualified to answer mm -hmm. um and I just didn't have those skills at that time to like you know I feel like a lot of what I've learned as a sex educator um in the past five years has been more about setting those boundaries than mm -hmm. about like specific knowledge. Like I've definitely gotten more knowledge. I definitely, you know, I'm constantly learning from other people, but that's the knowledge is like something that you have to keep up with. Um, and so I feel like more than anything, I was like, oh wow, I really need some support learning how to be in this role. And so when I graduated college, I started working at Shebop, which is a feminist sex shop in Portland and I also enrolled at the Institute of Sexuality Education and Enlightenment um, and through that those experiences I gained so many um, so much support from people who are already doing this work and that was like the most valuable thing for me was to have mentors who were like teaching in the community um, who were serving communities that like were that they were part of mm -hmm. as well and being like you know kind of asking those questions of like who are we here for and like why are we doing this work and really um being oriented towards the the needs of our communities rather than just being in a mindset of like I want to have fame or status or I want to be popular or well known so mm -hmm. um which was never really the point for me but like and I feel like they talk about this at IC sometimes that there is there is a realm of sex education that's like very focused on status mm -hmm. um, so I think about that a lot of being like how can I how can I like make my work very much tailored towards what people actually need yeah. rather than it being like the tuck show yeah <laughs> and like relatable content that people can take bite-sized pieces from and apply to their own life or never have realized something about themselves and have just felt so understood yeah. and I think that is kind of the nice thing about IC is it I think it oftentimes breeds a lot of people sex educators that are more along that track and then sometimes I see sex educators that are along that track calling out the famous look at me sex educators and calling out things where they're falling short, which is actually very refreshing and very empowering to see. Yeah. Yeah. I think about this a lot in regard to like cancel culture. Cause I feel like something that was really important for me when I was 
beginning my business. So now I have my own business, Interessential Education, and I do like workshops and one-on-ones with folks and um, just like a lot of different things. And when I was starting that business, I, I thought a lot and like reflected a lot on the fact that I was like going to be birthing this, this like entity that exists within a white supremacist system Mm -hmm. and exists within capitalism and how I could like birth this entity without feeling so connected to it that I couldn't like let go of it and relinquish it when my community like called upon me to do that. And so I was just thinking a lot about like, yeah, this, the, the dynamic of being like, especially as a white educator, it feels really important to be like, yeah, like there, there's probably going to be a time when my role that I'm in right now is not as, is like, is obsolete or it's like, you know, like I want to be like moving, making space for more people, not like, Mm -hmm. like putting my, like sinking my nails into my business and being like, this is mine. Uh Um, So I feel like a lot of the time people perceive that experience of being like, actually serving the community Mm -hmm. as like a cancel culture thing because they're like Mm -hmm. oh if the community critiques me if I get this bad feedback or this hard feedback then that's like their fault and Mm -hmm. that's not my problem versus Mm -hmm. being like I'm gonna orient towards what people are telling me and sometimes that means like deplatforming yeah or like giving your business up so yeah 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 it's very interesting thank you for sharing that yeah okay, so now we'll get to the hot topics uh, <laughs> of dirty talking and role-playing so I think like these topics I think just in my experience as a sex educator and just similarly people coming to me a lot of the stuff is what people will come to me about but they'll just kind of mention it in passing mm-hmm. and usually in under the guise of like I can't do that uh, yeah. Sure. yeah so if you could break it down for us for what sure. is we talking what is role playing and how can they help us and mm-hmm. transform our sexual lives yeah uh, dirty talk and role play they're, they're very intertwined like they definitely play on each other both of them have an aspect of creativity and playfulness and like improvisation on some level like acting on some level um I have been thinking a lot about this spectrum of the way that like you can you can role play and dirty talk um in in a way that's much closer to your comfort zone and like who you are and like kind of how you naturally move through the world and then you could also engage with it on the total opposite side of the spectrum of being like I am embodying a character who I would never want to be or I'm doing something that I would never want to do in any other situation and I'm saying things that I that are you know very unusual for me to say and so whenever I'm talking to people about it I feel like there's an assumption that all role-playing and dirty talk is like this other side of the spectrum right Mm -hmm. I'm imagining you know I'm dressing up as a maid and it's like you know and like talking in a totally different way or like being really dominant when I'm usually submissive or like or like saying things that make me feel really uncomfortable to hear or I don't want somebody to say to me um and so for me that's just sort of like a you know there's two aspects like one some people are just not going to be into role play and dirty talk and like that's fine right like it's an option it's an invitation and then the other aspect of that is that we can we can um, curate our role play and dirty talk experiences so they actually are expressions of our own sexual desire and our sexual pleasure and things that actually feel good to say. So I think about that a lot in terms of the difference between being like, there's this thing that I want to say, but I'm scared to say it versus I feel like I'm forcing myself to say something that's not authentic to me. And when it when there's something where it's like, I want to say this, but there's like a block, then that's when we start exploring like shame and fears and anxiety. And like, and that's when you just kind of lean into being like, let's practice saying those words out loud. Like how can you kind of like slowly build your tolerance mm-hmm. um, 
or for engaging in this really playful activity. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Do you feel like that's clear? Yeah. And I think something I personally found helpful for dirty talking for myself was it's like just a communication tool really at the end of the day. So when you're in a sexual situation, dirty talking could be like, can you lick me here? Right. Um, Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. Like all it is, is just like describing or articulating or sharing different things about what are what's going on and it's a tool so it's like it's something that you can utilize in one situation and not in another like there are some situations where I feel like this is a good example like I've been having a really stressful week so I was like talking to the partner that I live with and I was like I really just want to like have like I really want to be able to just like receive some pleasure without having to like emote at all like I don't want to have to like make any noises like it might seem like I'm a little bit of like just like a floppy like blob on the bed but that's what I really need right now because I just like want to relax and they were like oh great like no worries um and then I actually noticed like as I was getting more turned on that I naturally started to like make more noises which I was like oh that's interesting Um, yeah I was like in some ways it was just like not having the pressure I was like yeah pressured to have to be like oh yeah like I love that um yeah yeah so that was just making me think about how there are times when yeah maybe I'm like okay I really want to enact I have this fantasy like I really love I I love um like doing all sorts of like mask for mask or like kind of like gay boy fantasies. So like one time I was doing this like broke back mountain role playing. Right. And so it was like me and my partner were like practicing sort of our like cowboy draws. And we were like, like getting very silly with it before we even started. This is just when we were talking about the fantasy. Mm -hmm. So that was like a totally different experience of being like, Oh, this is, this is fun and playful. and, Mm -hmm. And this is what feels like the thing we want to be doing yeah and what a nurturing thing for a relationship dynamic to mm-hmm. p- engage in play in that way even removing the sexual elements to it is it, it's, it's like a way to bond and a way to, to do something new that's novel that can spark some sexual desire and yeah. I just love that concept and I think people again are so intimidated by role-playing Um, and again, to your knowledge, to your point, like the schoolgirl or the maid or whatever, like it doesn't, the teacher, you know, it's those dynamics aren't really what it is. It's it's what you want and how you identify and what feels enticing to you. And it doesn't have to look like costumes (laughs) unless you want it to. Right. Like you can pick and choose just like elements of something too to incorporate like you know if you if you did feel you know maybe you're like turned on by the idea of like role playing as a maid um but you're like I don't want to wear that costume like use like a feather duster Mm. or like you know if you want to just kind of embody or like check in with a different version of yourself different like kind of character then, you know, wear some fake glasses and like, or like to, you know, you could be like, oh, I'm kind of a teacher vibe. I'm going to wear fake glasses or I'm going to wear like a blazer um, and just sort of like see how that changes things. But I do think it requires a huge amount of vulnerability and Mm -hmm. intimacy to do that kind of playing Mm -hmm. because you really are trusting that your partner is not going to sneer at you or laugh Mm -hmm. at you or belittle you or being silly or like you know trying something that's outside of how you maybe maybe usually comport yourself yeah so if people are finding themselves very curious about dirty talking and role playing but are again very intimidated by it yeah. and worried that their partner's going to judge them or just afraid of their own voice and their own desires like what tips you have for someone to make baby steps into exploring these two things yeah well so one of my favorite tools to use if you are experiencing like you specifically said like being afraid of your own voice I feel like that's a really common experience to be like 
just making words happen. It is, it is like actually physiologically difficult for our brains to um, create words and like speak when we're in a really high state of arousal. So we're already up against that. Like that's a tool, that's a, a skill that we have to develop. And a great way to do that is to practice this like really specific activity where you masturbate and then just like the entire time that you're masturbating, just like make sure that sounds are coming out of your mouth. Mm. It can just be like, bah, 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 or you can be like, I'm masturbating. Like, here I go. Like I'm doing it. Um, or you can like say sexy things to yourself. Um, and, and know that the goal, like if that, makes it hard for you to have an orgasm in that masturbation sesh, like sesh, like that's okay. Right. Mm -hmm. The point being that you're just practicing getting words out while your body is engaging in in a, in a sexual space. And then once that's like feeling, once you're feeling ready to like kind of bring that same energy into an encounter with a partner and you can do so, like sometimes it can be helpful to do so in a little bit more of a contained space, like saying like, Hey, I want to practice this. So like, can you go down on me? Um, for like, let's set a timer for five minutes. You go down on me and I'm just going to like, describe how it feels. Mm. Or if that's too hard, describe what the room looks like. Describe like what your, what you had for, for dinner that day, or you're like anything that you're like, I, this feels achievable just to literally like practice that pathway yeah. of making it, making your words come out of your mouth. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love that. Yeah. But then I feel like another aspect, like that's sort of the more personal process. And then there's also the relational aspect of dirty talk or role playing. And so I feel like whenever we're communicating with partners about a new thing that we're interested in. It can be really helpful to just start with a, an open conversation, like an open question about being like, what's, what have been your experiences of dirty talk or role play up until this point? Like, what do you know about those things? Um, what have you learned about them? I find it to be so helpful to ask those specific questions before Hmm. into my own desires because it kind of it can help you understand the like why a partner might respond in a certain way and so then you're kind of like front loading that information versus being like hey I'm really into this thing like do you want to do it and then if they're like no I don't really want to that can feel like such a harsh rejection versus being like hey have you ever like role played with somebody before and they're like Mm -hmm. yeah I did once and it was like a really negative experience and the person made me feel really self-conscious and it's like okay it makes sense that you're not that excited to do this like yeah got it that makes sense so I think that just was part of my journey of understanding joy talk and role play was being in sexual situations and like things would happen that would arouse me but I couldn't put my finger on them and then like one example was as I ended up taking a kink quiz for kink personalities and then it ranked my personality and what there's like a hundred there's so many there's like <laughs> there's just infinite and I think there's maybe like 35 plus um and my first one was brat and I was like whoa like that was it was so illuminating to me to understand like what to ask for what I need what arouses me what is fun to me and like a potential role-playing dynamic that could feed into that um and I just I wouldn't have connected that without the language to tell me what was an opportunity for me to explore um and I found that was something that would help me bond me to my partner too, to see what their rankings were and what they subconsciously found to be arousing, whether that's like looking in a certain way or, you know, um, playing a certain role or being like, like my partner uses some, some like sweet buzzwords that I'm like, I think there's something here to, uh, play like discover a little bit like with like dollies and stuff you know um so I'm like you know that's curiosity strike rather than judgment and 
that is just yeah. only deepens your sexual experience. So true. Yeah, I think there's one test on the internet that's like BDSM test dot com mm-hmm. like that. and yeah I actually like really encourage people to look it up and and use the questions as conversation starter too um because all of the questions are really interesting it'll be like you know do you enjoy like watching your partner um you know do s- sort of more like childlike things like coloring or like you know talk in a cutesy voice yeah um, and then you can kind of, then you rank like how, how much you like that. And then it's like, oh, like maybe I'm into a little bit of like a little play or like yeah play. Um, and I feel like sometimes we don't always put those things together because we might just be like, oh, like this is just a cute thing that my partner does or like, yeah, yeah like you're saying, like we're just sort of like receiving a lot of stimuli mm-hmm. without knowing And I think that this is just like a lack of sex education without being able to track like, oh, that stimulus is, is, I can recognize that that's a little bit of like an age play kink. Like I see. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Even in terms of like sexuality and desire and interest and all of that, like because of lack of sex education and then receiving stimuli and not understanding how to process mm. what is interesting to you or exciting to you because yeah. you haven't been told that that's an option right. <laughs> is really unfortunate and it's like a pleasure to be able to try to encourage people to explore that part of themselves or more deeply understand that part of themselves yeah and That's, I think about it every day, honestly. Yeah, for real. I think about this all the time. There's so many things that I wasn't really into until I like met someone who was into mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh yeah, like that's awesome. Like I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me to like put things in my butt. But like the mm-hmm. fact that you really want to do that, like now I'm excited about it. Yeah, so, totally. Um, yeah, I think, I think there, it is, special that there are some people in the world who have this really really strong clarity about what turns them on yeah and other people who are kind of like ah, I don't know yeah, um, so yeah. I like care of those people so they can explore um, yeah yeah further I have all these fantasies about like if I had like a ton of funding to do like sex research that I would do stuff like that where I'd be like you know like get people to like consensually pair people and be like oh you have no idea what you're into you know exactly uh-huh. what you're into like what could you learn from yeah. each other and I'm sure both could learn so much from each other yeah so, yeah um yeah but I do feel like role-playing and dirty talk in particular are so so big and so broad that, that I think that that could be kind of a barrier for folks sometimes because they're like I don't even know where to start like all yeah. I can think of are these very like overplayed like kind of porn scenarios yeah. that maybe don't feel that sexy to somebody or maybe do feel sexy to some people but it's like you know I, I can totally understand somebody being like I'm just maybe even the fact that they've seen it in porn a lot is a turn yeah off. yeah um, But that's why I always, I feel like I'm always sort of on the lookout for something to role play because Mm -hmm. I'll do things like, like my Brokeback Mountain role play, like (laughs) because I was watching the movie with a partner and we were like, this is kind of hot. And then we were both kind of like, oh yeah, like we can literally do whatever we want. Yeah. So, you know, that's cool. Yeah. Like if you're ever watching a movie and you're like, wow, this movie is really sexy or like you know, I'm feeling a little turned on in this situation. Bookmark it. Yeah. Yeah. Just the universe of sexuality is just so vast oh, and that's... it's endless, which is so something we all share as well, which is so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's so much to uncover. I love thinking about this because like, you know, there are so many things that people are into there's like, you know, sexual fads that happen or like trends where a lot of people will be Mm -hmm. into something for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so whenever somebody like comes to me and they're like, I have this like king or this interest that, 
feels just like really weird and no one's into it I'm like maybe no one's into it because they just haven't heard about it yet (laughs) yes 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 I was even thinking like I have like my favorite vibrator and I was like this is my favorite vibrator however that's because I don't know about all these other vibrators and I, it's For now. It's so <laughs> in, like I can in my mind and I'm okay with that but there's just such a big world out there that I just don't you don't know until you experience it and even like if you see it on porn you might not even know how it feels to you unless you experience it um with with someone in person so true mm. what is your biggest takeaway or like biggest life lesson or favorite thing you've learned about yourself after immersing yourself in sex education work? Mm, um, hundred percent my gender exploration. That's like, I really, I really feel so grateful that I was able to learn so much about gender variance and like just non-binary existences like just not many people in the world like that really only happened to me when I was in the sex education realm Mm -hmm. um so I feel really really lucky that I was exposed to those things and then was also in a position being around so many queer sex educators who are like who just kept being like you should do what feels good to you and I was like whoa (laughs) that is that is a just such a revolutionary thought and then as soon as I started do doing what felt good to me then I started making all these changes Mm -hmm. that were really affirming and wonderful and joyful and like really hard and in other ways too but that I think that that like that idea of moving towards what feels good and like prioritizing pleasure as a foundation of my life is what allowed me to come out as non-binary and now like next week I'm getting top surgery. Yeah. So exciting. And exciting. yeah, I just like, I, I remember when I was first, yeah, like starting to think about sexuality and gender and like learning about top surgery. And I remember just having this like seed of a thought of being like, wow, like that, I'm really curious about that. Like I'm, uh-huh. I want more. And so to just feel sort of like the fruition of, these seeds that were planted years ago yeah it was special and such a good reminder to me too that sometimes when people come across my work like they might just like receive it and and then it it might like just sit with them for a while before it really like takes hold and starts to change something so I do feel like the world is changing a little bit. And, you know, when I think about at least my group of friends, like queerness wasn't a, wasn't a widely known thing. And so everyone was very confused for a very long time. And then queerness became way more popular. And people were like, oh. <laughs> yeah. No, I understand. But even then, like, I think for so many people understanding their identity and their sexuality and their desires just didn't come easily because no one was, we, none of us were taught anything. Yeah. Like I only remember STDs and I only remember them being bad. Bad. Yeah. Terrifying and bad. Yeah. And it, it did not like, no one told me that it was just like fine. If you got an STD. <laughs> Like, no one until no one. Pretty recently and I actually said that on Instagram and some people got real mad at me on Instagram because they were like are you saying it's okay to give people STDs and I was like no I'm saying you're not a bad person yeah get an STD like yeah. why is that such a hot take yeah. Um, yeah but yeah it's so true I think like in particular, because I guess you'll probably post this, not that you're not going to post this this week, but flashback for those of you listening to this, watching this, that this week is like bisexuality awareness week. And so I feel like in particular, there's been um, such a wonderful surge of more awareness around like, yeah, this when it is more um, nuanced and expansive and pansexual and bisexual. Yeah, and that is so wonderful to see that, like, people who are bisexual and pansexual and just queer yeah. in general 
yeah able to explore and uh, myself included and like feel like their whole identities can show up yeah and that it's valid like I I am also by pansexual and I was just confused for so long. It's very confusing. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's probably yeah. bisexual. Hence, bisexually, bisexuality awareness week. I can't imagine. I feel like it was the most. I feel like I was the most confused when I like thought that I was like a cisgender woman too, because then I was like, I don't understand what's happening. Because like, am I straight? And I just have, and I'm just not homophobic. Uh-huh. Like, is that what's happening? Or am I like? am I a lesbian like am I like what is happening and it was actually when I like got clarity on my gender that now I'm like it literally I don't it does not matter to me anymore because I'm like I'm non-binary so like everyone that dates me yeah in a queer relationship Mm -hmm. and I wish that I had I like I aspire to offer that energy to other bisexual people because I'm like you just need to have that like yeah you're all (laughs) queer (laughs) yeah where can people like connect with you more deeply and um just get to know you better yeah um so on instagram my instagram is at intra underscore sensual and my website is intrasensual dash education dot teachable dot com and on that website you can find like like I have recorded classes um that my lovely partner who's a filmmaker recorded so they're like high quality Mm -hmm. and um, that's also where you can buy tickets for my live workshops and then I also do one-on-one work with folks which has been I honestly feel like kind of like the main place where my heart has been recently I'm really enjoying doing Mm one-on-one coaching and education Mm -hmm. um, with students and so if you want to do that work with me then you can do a consultation and then we'll like talk about what your needs are and stuff and then move on and uh yeah I don't know I'm available like I'm just very available on like Instagram DMs yeah DMs or respond to emails sometimes yeah. but like I do yeah. <laughs> yeah you're very active on Instagram you're always posting stuff and you have a lot of workshops am I correct is that correct yes yeah I definitely not only do I have like quite a few recorded workshops on my website but I regularly teach workshops so yeah yeah that's great and I definitely recommend following you on Instagram because you are full of fun educational content and I whenever I absorb your content I just I feel good like it's it's really feel good and it, it's it's just I smile every time so it's it's really a pleasure so I highly recommend it to anyone who's listening or watching <laughs> thanks thank you yeah, you're welcome <laughs>